Mm-hmm. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this house will torture the enemy. We have some two fantastic speakers for you tonight. Uh, before we introduce those, just a reminder of the format. Tonight we have a dynamic student time of five to seven minutes, while guest speakers will receive ten minutes to speak. The audience is, of course, welcome to interject at points after the bell, sounding like this, and before the, the, the final round of the night. You can offer a point of information by standing up and saying on that point, and to offer a short snippet of the counter argument for traction point information. Feel free, of course, to, uh, to announce your, your agreement or disagreement with shame or here, here. Uh, our speakers, so on each of your sheets, our seats, you'll find a sheet on order to return, which you can rate the students uh, at the end of the year, approaching rapidly with the Adams of the Award, the Gold Medal Award for eight. Note, number two, Glenn Rogers, shall read, uh, welcome to good one. Okay, our speakers tonight, on proposition, and it was very difficult to find a proposition speaker for this motion, but we prevailed, and we have Mr. Paul McDonald, founder of the Open Republic Institute, pro-capitalist, pro-Western, and believer in the value of empire. So ladies and Paul McDonald. Position currently suffering some tax delay. We have Michael Finucane, chairperson of the Law Society of Human Rights, Human Rights Committee, and former chairperson for the ICC, L, as was found out here. So to get the ball rolling, we call on Andrew Thornbury to open the case. Ladies and gentlemen of the University Philosophical Society, ladies and gentlemen, as Spock lay dying on a land far away from his home country, he reminded Admiral Kirk and their crew, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, or even the needs of the one. And ladies and gentlemen, torturing the one as far as outweighs the benefits of, of saving the many instead of torturing the one. Because in a time of war, you have to torture the enemy in order to save many. We have to do this for two reasons. First of all, because it's the right thing to do in order to get information, which will always, always work, and even if it doesn't, I'll get to my later point. And secondly, how the person who is being tortured has abandoned their rights to dignity. And therefore, for the many, he doesn't actually have a, 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 any rights at all. So torturing him doesn't affect any moral issues that we may have. But first of all, on to my first point about how torture will actually... Well, first of all, I'll tell you a little bit what I, about what I mean by torture. Torture is the systematic and deliberate infliction of acute pain on one person by another in order to acquire information from them. This can be physical or psychological. The enemy in this case is any enemy of the state which is at war, be that war against a country or be that a war on terrorism and against terrorists. So why will torture work? How will torture get us information in... Uh, no, thank you. In, to, to get, get us information in a war? Because let's face it, war is cruelty. The crueler it is, the sooner it will be over. And information is the quickest way to end a war. Because if you know the way that your enemy is going to act, you can intercede and kill them quicker. No, thank you. If a terrorist holds information about your citizens and refuses to hold it, and you only have a little bit of time to, to get it out of them, well then torturing is clearly the most effective way to get it out of them. And yes, the proposition will come up here and say, the opposition will come up here and say, oh no, it doesn't work because they're going to give us the wrong information anyway, and then there's absolutely no point. Well, we're hardly going to torture someone, and then when they're feeling the first bit of pain, say, oh, he's over there, he's definitely over there, I tell you 100% promise, super promise he's over there. We're hardly going to go rushing over there, no. We're, with our torturing, no, thank you, with our torturers, we are going to have a, a behavior analysis unit because people, at their basis instinct, are animals and they have a breaking point. And that breaking point can be psychologically, psychologically analyzed. And once we find that breaking point, we find that no matter what this person is saying, no matter how much they are trying to like, defend the truth of, their, of whatever they're trying to defend, no thank you, they will ultimately break and ultimately let something loose. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about World War II and go back in time a little bit and talk about the Enigma, the Enigma machine the Germans invented for code cracking. The Enigma machine worked on the basis of that it was, a, it was no, no thank you, it was the most powerful thing that, the most powerful encoding machine that ever been invented. And in order to break it, the Allies brought in a group of like crop, like a cryptographer, crypt, crypto bubblers or whatever they're called, <laughs> that, that write those silly crosswords and then like crack them. Logic puzzles, people who play chess, people who think logically. And they would work on the Enigma machine and like use their logic to try and break it. 
And usually by 3 or 4 p.m. or 5 p.m. or 6 p.m., they had cracked the machine. Because it only takes one little strand to unravel the entire thing, and then the entire thing comes undone. But by 4 or 5 o'clock, hundreds of people had died at the hands of the Germans. And so they realised this, and as the war went on, they began bombing cities in France. They began bombing cities in Germany in order that the Germans would start talking to each other about these things that had happened. In order that the machine would start to unravel quicker, so they get the information quicker. So instead of 5 or 6 p.m., the codes would be broken at 9 or 10 a.m., and the people could be saved quicker. The codes could be broken quicker. The war could end quicker. This is what we, this is what we kind of want to do, except instead of killing hundreds of people by bombing a city, we want to torture the enemy to get the information. And the information, as we said, no thank you, is already, uh, no matter what, is, is going to be there. And so what if we capture someone truly innocent in our war, in a fight against, to find out if someone's going to die, in, 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 if hundreds of people are going to die because of a bomb. We say that no matter what in war, you're going to have casualties of war. And okay, so, uh, so, so if, if we're going to torture them, it's slightly worse, it's not even slightly worse than dying, they're still alive. No, thank you. They st <laughs> we still say that there are always going to be casualties of war, and we accept this. And the opposition will come here and say, well, if we have a system for getting information, it's open to abuse. I see at least we still have a system to abuse. Instead of like an anthrax bomb going off in the centre of America, wiping out 250 million people all at once in one go. We don't accept this, and therefore we say torture is good for getting information to stop these kind of things. Um, no, thank you. Actually, yes, just for you on. How do you feel? Okay, I get you. So what I was saying to us that it is more moral to let hundreds of people die instead of letting one person just go on, uh, who, one person who is attacking a nation, who, has, who potentially and probably has information that could kill your family, that could kill your platoon, that could kill all the families of your home country in one fell swoop. And she says that it's better than, that we let hundreds of people die instead of this. So when we say no, we say that this person has sacrificed their rights to any, to any like, moral cause. We say that, that because they are, in, they are inherently attacking a city, because like, okay, just, let's just put a little, little twist on it. Say, imagine that there was a bomb in this room at this current time. You are all going to die in, five, in, in 12 hours, and you, this room is locked in, and each and every single one of you will die if this bomb is not, dead in it, is, is not, um, is not dismantled. Because yes, in ordinary situations, killing someone isn't right. But in war, killing someone is necessary. And yes, in ordinary situations, it isn't good to torture someone. But in war, it's different. This is an extraordinary circumstances. The, this, the lives of the many are at stake here. And for one person to undergo waterboarding or clipping off the two nails, because torture is horrible, and we're not denying that. But we are saying that doing it to one person, this one person who is attacking your nation, who has sacrificed any right to human dignity because he is trying to take away the human dignities of many more people than himself, we say that that is a much better way, a much better way of dealing with it than people, and, and he has sacrificed all rights so that torture doesn't actually inflict upon the morality of any situation. Because this is war, and the moralities of war become a lot different to the moralities of everyday life. So ladies and gentlemen, what have I talked to you today? I've opened up the case of how te of torture might actually work for getting information because of psychological interrogation and psychological pain, and people have breaking points that we can get information. And secondly, how people who are trying to go against the nation, who are trying to literally kill millions of people, uh, we, uh, and we say that we want to dismantle them, that the morality issue doesn't exist. So ladies and gentlemen, I urge you to propose this motion. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, what if we're the bad guys? What if the enemy is acting in self-defense and defending what is moral in the world? The proposition have assumed that war is always just, but if torture is an acceptable weapon in times of war, is there anything that we can define as falling under the umbrella of what is a war crime? Is it okay, if it is okay to so directly and so viciously strip the enemy of any of their bodily autonomy, then is mass rape of women in tribal communities in Africa acceptable? Is genocide acceptable? To paraphrase my learned colleague, Sean McKiernan, if torture is, is good, <laughs> then what's bad? 
<laughs> to also quote uh, another learned man, uh, Lord Hoffman of the House of Lords, who once said that the use of torture is dishonourable because it corrupts and degrades the state which uses it and the legal system which accepts it. So on this line, I want to talk to you tonight about, first of all, how the use of torture strips the state of all of its values, and second of all, how we, no, thank you, how we strip our own soldiers of their humanity when we force them to act as torturers. No thanks. Why is torture so fundamentally wrong that we cannot even wish it on our own worst enemy? All is not fair in love and war. That's sort of a myth we perpetuate when we want to sort of steer us away from the idea that states do bad things in war, acting out of their own self-interest. Torture is bad because it treats its victims as a means to an end and not an end in themselves. In war, a soldier must dehumanize the enemy in order to be able to perform, but torture causing them to do so like extremely explicitly and when their enemy is completely unarmed and defenseless, it's like shooting a man when his back is turned to you. The physical body of the victim in torture becomes purely a vehicle for achieving the torturer's aims, no thank you. The enemy is a pawn who was manipulated through their pain and that is what makes it so abhorrent. We destroy their autonomy, no thanks. We violate their dignity. We undermine every value we hold dear in a Western liberal democracy when we violate their bodily autonomy in such a violent and disgusting manner, no thank you. And when we strip them of the legal right which we hold so dear, no thank you, that you always have the right to remain silent and you always will have the right to a fair trial. We have no measure, no thanks, of, of the accuracy of terror in extracting information because under torture a prisoner will say anything to stop the pain. I know Andrew tried to like give this sort of weird metric of we can determine a breaking point but seeing as like the pain threshold for everyone, the psychological endurance for everyone is always going to be different and we haven't like even considered the question of what if the person you're torturing doesn't have any information in the first place? How do we evaluate that and what do we do if they're of no use to us? No thanks. The interrogator is never sure when they have obtained the truth and when do they stop with the torture. Our legal system explicitly excludes involuntary statements and forced confessions for this reason. And if law is the codification of the ethics, no thank you, which we all subconsciously want to work towards and which we all want to live by, and then everything that torture is undermines those principles and flies in the face of everything that we have codified in law, no thank you, because they're ethics that we consider to be so important. Torture damages, I'll take you, yeah. Wait, like, but the fact is, it's in war. Like, we also think murder is a bad thing. We don't allow, like, in, like in, in law. The fact is, like, this helps us win the war. So we do okay. it the same way that we kill people because it helps us win right. the war. The difference between that, when you go out onto the battlefield, you have something like the barrel of a gun or the artillery or, or the battlefield to separate you from the enemy. And the enemy is armed themselves. Like, what torture does is you, you have extreme power, you have absolute power over someone who is totally defenseless. And it kind of flies in that face of that mantra we say about the schoolyard bully to pick on somebody your own size, to like not shoot a man when his back is turned to you. It breaks, no thank you. The fact that we say that war crimes exist and we acknowledge that there are some things in war that happen that are so abhorrent in the first place, I think pretty much like, proves that there are some things that even in war, even though no thank you, it is, an ex it is a special circumstance and some exceptions must be made, there are still things that for basic principles of human rights and basic ethics we must always say are unacceptable. No thanks. Torture damages the reputation of the institution that carries it out because, like basically for three reasons. First of all, it damages the reputation of moral authority and like that has massive consequences in terms of international relations in terms of the respect that other states will have for you and how you interact with other communities. Like for example, like America damaged their integrity as the leader of the free world by the fact that they haven't closed Guantanamo Bay yet. No thank you. And that is something that everyone is massively critical of America for in terms of international relations. Second of all, it provides the enemy with something that they can exploit for propaganda by saying these guys are torturing the men that we're sending out to defend our country. No thank you. They're disgusting. They're vile. They're immoral actors. When the state itself beats and extorts, it can no longer be said to rest on foundations of morality and justice. Now what the state rests on is foundations of force and violence. Third of all, it, the and this is the most terrifying aspect of torture, 
If we torture the enemy, no thank you, the enemy is now legitimised in capturing and torturing our soldiers. And when we ask men and women to serve our countries, we ask them to risk their lives, but we cannot ask them to be violently debased in the name of their country. We cannot expect that of them. When soldiers return from the battlefield, like a huge amount of them suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, when Christopher Hitchens famously underwent, underwent waterboarding, he lasted 10 seconds and like, experienced PTSD for months afterward. This is because torture is so explicit and so intense, and that is why we cannot wish it on our worst enemy. No, thank you. Right. Not only do we defile the autonomy of the enemy through torture, when we like, ask our fellow countrymen to torture another, we strip them of their own humanity. Torture causes the most psychological harm to those, no thank you, who are forced to carry it out. They are likely to become brutalised by their acts and desensitised to humanity. Every soldier must kill, but they have the barrel of the gun, they have the artillery, they have the battlefield, they have the peace of mind that the enemy themselves has armed, and this is fair game, and it's a fair fight. Torture, you ha it's you with your torture tools, degrading an unarmed man who is completely defensive in the face of your power. Tor you torture his body, you wear down his psyche until he succumbs to your will. This flies in the face like, of everything that we stand for in terms of fairness, in terms of equality, in terms of the most basic ethics. Like, the power dynamic you create will mean that the torturer is no longer human. They galvanise themselves in the sadistic act because it's the only way that they're able to force themselves to actually be able to carry it out. They lose complete sight of any level of perspective. And when the person you're torturing screams no and pleads you to stop, you have to dehumanise yourself more and more to enable you to keep going until you succeed. The Stanford prison experiment was pulled after a few days for this reason. Can you imagine if the prison guards had the tools of torture in their hands and were able to waterboard the people that they were holding in prison? Torture is disgusting. It flies in the face of the values that democracy perpetuates. It is brutal, it is vile, and it is always a war crime. I wouldn't wish it on my own worst enemy, and neither should you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of the College of Philosophical Society, ladies and gentlemen, I have a number of uh, misgivings about supporting this motion, and so let me say right away that I am prepared to support it only on the basis of some very stringent caveats and only on the basis of a definition of torture that excludes any actual physical or lasting psychological harm. As a libertarian, I am not generally disposed to allowing the state free reign to harm individuals in its custody, and so when I was asked to speak on this motion, I set about creating a definition of torture that suits my purpose. <laughs> this is a definition that excludes physical or lasting psychological harm, but which nonetheless creates discomfort and psychological pressure. Of course, my scenario uh, is that the interrogator is an employee of a government whose aims in the situation will include some unambiguous good, such as combating a dangerous terrorist organization. This interrogator is skilled and knows or strongly suspects that the prisoner has information, the yielding of which will contribute to a public good, such as the prevention of a terrorist attack or the curbing of a terrorist organization or enemy government. Yes? Are you not aware that the means of torture do not need long lasting effects, are very efficient means of torture, hence would not extract the information that it needs? It's a risk I'm prepared to take. So, <laughs> what are the caveats? I mean that, literally, it's a risk I'm prepared to take. What are the caveats? The caveats are that the we uh, doing the torturing must be clearly or mostly in the right in the situation. That is to say that we are trying to prevent harm to uh, innocent people, the welfare of whom must outweigh the discomfort to the prisoner. Two, the interrogation, including the torture, so-called, must not, as I have said, <coughs> cause any lasting physical or psychological, any physical harm or any lasting psychological injury. Three, uh, the entire interrogation ought to be filmed uh, with sound. And four, a doctor should be on hand to ensure that no physical or lasting psychological harm could occur to the prisoner. Five, violation of the testable, verifiable parts of these provisions, i.e. provisions uh, two to four, will result in severe consequences to interrogators and those further up the chain of command. Such violations should also 
open the state to claims of compensation by prisoners whose rights are violated. And finally, six, perhaps, and most crucially of all, the prisoner must not be a prisoner of war, i.e. a prisoner who is protected by the Geneva Convention. Yes? I am prepared to take that risk. There may be none. There may be none. I'm, I'm positive there might be. Certainly, I think the idea is that, the, is that there should be enough discomfort on, on, on psychological, psychological discomfort on the prisoner. And only, of course, if, if there is information that you are sure the prisoner has. So, with all these caveats, I thought I should get that out of the way first. The problem when we discuss torture, or so-called torture, such as waterboarding, uh, is that in much of the Middle East, for example, real harmful, cruel treatment is meted out to prisoners as punishment in itself. Yes. Okay. This what is great. Well, I'm talking. I mean, I would justify, for example, with these caveats, I would justify uh, waterboarding of a prisoner who it was felt had information that would be useful. Waterboarding does cause intense psychological long-term PTSD. That's why, under your idea, even that would be not allowed. I'm taking that risk, for the moment. <laughs> now, prisoners of the regime, for example, in Syria, and perhaps prisoners of the rebels, are subjected to brutal treatment by thugs who see themselves as avengers uh, or enforcers. This is certainly not about eliciting information. So that's not what I'm talking about. So that's a quick summary of the circumstances under which I think it's reasonable to use so-called interro enhanced interrogation, or some might say torture. And I assume a civil authority pursuing a demonstrable public good seeking information from a prisoner or suspect who they have good reason to believe has that information using techniques that cause temporary discomfort but no physical harm and no lasting psychological harm. However, I cannot leave off without some comments on what I take to be some of the confused thinking of those who take the view that everything the United States does in response to 9-11 or did not 9-11 is somehow bad or made them somehow just as bad as the terrorists. Just a moment. Firstly, uh, Al-Qaeda and other terrorists pretty much publicly declared war on the USA and the West in general. Those in Afghanistan taking part in armed attacks against coalition forces uh, were not wearing the uniform of any country. And you may not know this, but combatants in a conflict who are not wearing the uniform of their country are not afforded protection under the Geneva Convention. You may not know this. If you were, for example, working uh, a, a British army in World War II and you were parachuted into France or Ger occupied France or Germany in World War II in civilian clothes for espionage purposes and you were captured, you were dead. You, the government, nobody made any attempt to help you because the rules were if you weren't wearing a uniform, there was no protection afforded you. And I think that the problem with a lot, of, a lot of these terrorist organizations is that they take advantage of the fact that they can wear civilian clothes and hide in the civilian population. Yes? What counts as important information to you? Oh, um, I suppose the names uh, and location of senior members of Al-Qaeda uh, or information about past attacks that have taken place. Now, having said that, you know, I mean, I'm not saying I'm necessarily right about this. I'm just positing this as, as a, a possible way to justify it. Uh, to me, it seems sensible. Um, so, a combatant who does not wear a uniform uh, arrogates to himself the advantage that comes from pretending to be a civilian, and this effectively endangers the civilians amongst whom he moves. The Geneva Convention recognizes this and accordingly does not offer him the same protection. Such a person, in my view, may, if my clear conditions, including, of course, that there must be a clear object of common welfare in securing information, which he is believed to hold, this person may be subject to enhanced interrogation so that important information can be elicited. A captured terrorist may have information that we need. He or she has no government that can be negotiated with. He or she works by hiding in our society or in the society of some lucky country that's been invaded by Western forces. And so we need to be able to go a little further in prosecuting our aims that we would, under circumstances of normal, normal criminal or military justice, or indeed where the person is held as a prisoner of war, in which case we have no right to ask them any questions whatsoever. Yes. No, but yes. Why do you think people lose their rights when they hide in the human population? Like, if rights are just for the decent people among us, are they rights at all? If you are engaged in a conflict and you are hiding in this civilian population without wearing the uniform of a country, then you are, in essence, gaming the system. 
In other words, you are, not in, you, you are engaging in a war, and yet you are dressed and pretending and disguising yourself as somebody who is not engaged in a war, which is inherently dishonest. And in fact, if anything, is likely to bring destruction upon the civilian population within which you hide. Now, I fear that much of the case to be made by those who oppose this motion will be made in the morally relativistic spirit that passes for nuance in those victim sciences that are so popular these days amongst young people who have been badly misled by the aging hippies who run about every institution in this country, not least the universities. Yes? <laughs> No, no, no. I, I'm arguing that this should be lawful. It should, there should be, this should be lawful. It should be transparent. It should be, it should be filmed. Uh, now, the morally relativistic view, I think, of many opponents uh, of this motion will see America as a sort of power hegemon, and they see the West as an oppressor, and really nothing else. And so I've said it here before, and it bears repeating. The conflicts in which Western countries are engaged will, I believe, in the long run, and it's given rise to this issue, in the long run, these conflicts will do some good. Though I think that that good will only come if there is consequent economic development. The collision of empire, of our values and our civilization, with the wannabe Stalins uh, who have run much of the Middle East for the last several generations, can only be good. That is not to say that I agree with particular strategies or every intervention, but I do believe that the long-run good of the poor parts of the world will rely on engagement with the, with the West, mainly through trade. Yes? So is your whole argument that you would only torture someone if you were definitely in the right, and if you would do them absolutely no damage, unless, of course, you need to, in which case you would do damage? So all you basically want to do is try to trick people into telling them the truth. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You scare the wits out of them. You, 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 you convince them you're going to kill them. Now, I fear the argument against enhanced, inter enhanced interrogation um, against dangerous, ununiformed combatants is often really just another pious, ill-informed attempt to undermine the moral case for Western values by implying that somehow by using these techniques, even under my conditions, we will undermine the values for which we stand. I disagree with that. I think there's a more sensible way. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much for this heavily caveat with risk-taking approach. And welcome our next guest speaker, as I said, former chairman for the Irish Council of Liberty, Mr. Michael Seavers. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, particularly for waiting for me. Uh, uh, as I was late, you really wouldn't believe the reason why. Um, but I told Rebecca of the uh, committee uh, the story in full. She has been sworn to secrecy under pain of torture if she reveals it to anyone. So uh, you're just going to have to take my word for it. <clears throat> I'm going to keep this short and to the point because it's all been said before by far more eloquent people than me. And our words have no impact on you. Therefore, I'm going to talk to you in a language that you understand. Our words are dead until we give them life with our blood. I'm sure by now the media has painted a suitable picture of me. This predictable propaganda machine will naturally try to put a spin on things to suit the government and to scare the masses into conforming to their power and wealth-obsessed agendas. I and thousands like me are forsaking everything for what we believe. Our driving motivation doesn't come from tangible commodities that this world has to offer. Our religion is Islam. Obedience to the one true God, Allah, and following the footsteps of the final prophet and messenger Muhammad. Your democratically elected governments continuously perpetuate atrocities against my people all over the world. And your support of them makes you directly responsible, just as I am directly responsible for protecting and avenging my Muslim brothers and sisters. Until we feel security, you will be our targets. And until you stop the bombing, gassing, imprisonment, and torture of my people, we will not stop this fight. We are at war, and I am a soldier. Now you too will taste the reality of this situation. These are the words of Muhammad Sadiq Khan, videotaped just before he blew himself up along with six other people in the Edgware Road tube station in 2007. And 
it points up something about the debate before us tonight that it doesn't fit into neat categories and it doesn't fit into cute little boxes where you can isolate the arguments simply and easily because what we've just chosen tonight to call the enemy is not a combatant who stands before us in a different colored uniform or flies a plane bearing a different type of symbol. It's a person who, as the previous speaker said, camouflages him or herself within a civilian population, uses and abuses the possibility of a human shield. So therefore, what we really have to consider is, does the end justify the means, not just on a moral level, but on a practical level, and on a level that will continue to affect future generations for maybe centuries to come? And if you think I'm joking about that or I'm, exp uh, I'm exaggerating, you only have to look at the tension that has been perpetuated over centuries between the West and the Middle East and the long-standing misunderstanding between the two cultures and the two civilizations. Now, you could decide you're going to torture somebody to get information. Uh, the information, of course, will not be voluntary. Because if you're right, it sort of begs the question, if you know you're right and you can read their minds, what are you torturing them for? But moving past that assumption, if you're right, then the information you get is logically designed to stop the torture. Now, a person who's being tortured, I would suggest, will tell you anything to stop the pain once they have reached their threshold. And everyone has a threshold. So how do you know the information is reliable? If you are in law enforcement, and you don't happen to be Jack Barr, possessed of all those superpowers he gets every time on 24, then you're working with a limited amount of resources in a limited period of time, and you have to work according to the information you get from the suspect. How do you know it's reliable? Is good information, or is bad information just as harmful as good information? Leaving aside the training this individual, if they are as deeply involved in terrorist activity as Sadiq Khan was, uh, and they pass the point in, that their training has inured in them to reach, and they're giving you the information, you are then diverting your resources to deal with it. But you've no way of being able to tell whether it's reliable. If I'm a, no thank you. I could quote the sage Quentin Tarantino, who committed it to celluloid, when he said, if you beat this prick long enough, he will tell you that he started the goddamn Chicago fire. But that doesn't necessarily make it so. You can't tell. And torture is not a reliable mechanism for getting information that will provide you with valuable intelligence to go out into the field. Sir? What if you disincentivize them with the lie by asking them questions you knew the answer to and kept on torturing them if they lied then? Wouldn't that create a cycle of movies and not lie? No, then you're torturing somebody for the purposes of getting your jollies because you know the answers to the questions you're asking them and it's a completely pointless exercise. And all you do is create an image of yourself as a torturer that will then go out into the world, be fed to vulnerable and gullible individuals like Sadiq Khan, who will then go and strap themselves with dynamite and walk into a tube station and kill, if you're lucky, six people. If you're not so lucky, 600 people. So anyway, you get the information. You've tortured your suspect. You've got the information. Maybe you've done something valuable with it. What are the repercussions? Well, the quotation I began with shows you what the repercu repercussions can be. You have two sorts of repercussions, of course. You have the public reaction, but you can get over that. Public opinion comes and goes. Eventually, it will fade. If you can demonstrate in time that you've done something valuable with the information you've obtained, even though it was by torturing somebody on the other side, the enemy, as we've chosen to call them, then eventually the public will probably come around. But the enemy, people from the communities in Iraq or Iran or Pakistan or Afghanistan, will never come round to your way of thinking. And they will take your methods and use them as a justification for attacking you again and again and again. Yes? Is it the case that the kind of people that are going to blow themselves up are going to do that anyway? And like, no matter what you do, they're going to find something in your actions uh, as a justification for their actions, like, well, whether you're torturing them or not? 
Well, if you're not torturing them, then the evidence would suggest that they're not going to attack you in those sorts of ways, or at least not going to attack civilians in those sorts of ways. We've had wars for millennia, but opposing forces did not historically uh, go into civilian targets and create uh, and attack them in the way of the September 11th bombing or the 7-7 bombings. But it's become a modern phenomenon. And why? Because certain, or certain countries in the West feel they have the moral authority to go in and dictate how certain countries should be run. We all know that despite the intelligence that was laid before the UN by Colin Powell, that Iraq did not have weapons of mass destruction, and yet it was used as a justification for the war, which, as we all know, was not a war uh, 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 that, that was begun with UN sanction. It was a unilateral action by one country that claimed, essentially, might is right. Is that really the position we want to be in? Leaving aside your moral scruples about it, are we safe in that position? This question has been asked repeatedly for the last 10, 12 years, no thanks, uh, since the attacks on the World Trade Center in 2001. Are we safer now than we were then? I don't think so. So what do you do about this? If you're not going to use torture, is there another method? Is there something more effective? I would suggest to you that there is. I would suggest to you the proper intelligence, uh, proper research, deep infiltration of communities and uh, communities that are susceptible to the sort of hate speech that Sadiq Khan broadcast, uh, recorded before he killed himself is possible. And if you obtain that intelligence in advance and act upon it and give law enforcement agencies the resources to be able to act upon it, well then you can prevent the atrocities. Not only that. <coughs> Maybe you can bring people around to your way of thinking. We talk about using torture, but have we tried persuasion? I mean, if you try and explain yourself to someone, most of the time they'll listen. And if you offer a compromise, most of the time they'll meet you halfway. And lest you think I'm exaggerating this, in an examination of uh, the MI5 agency, not long after uh, Eliza Manning and Buller was uh, appointed as the Director General, there was an analysis of the various methods used by intelligence agencies, and a contrast was drawn between Britain and America. The report said, or at least one, one intelligence officer said, the Americans tend to take a somewhat more aggressive and bullying approach in the field. We feel you can get a lot more information out of contacts if you use gentler methods. And this is what I'm talking about. Intelligence-led law enforcement makes us all safer. Ultimately, maybe it does come down to what you believe and what you think according to your own moral code. I don't think torture is justifiable. I don't think it works. I don't think it's effective. I think it creates more enemies than it... Uh, I, think it I don't think it... I think it creates more enemies uh, and harms our friends. It's a dangerous world out there, not, never more dangerous than now. But in my opinion, we are civilized and shouldn't torture people. And if we die, then we die as civilized people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the Philosophical Society, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, I want to talk about that last speech and also a bit about Roz's. And then I want to talk about like the, this, like that it's not just a utilitarian argument that we're putting forward on this side of the house that like there is a, like a, a method of seeing it as a rights-based argument that you don't have to just be John Stuart Mill, you can bring a bit of Kant, uh, which just sounds so bent. Uh, all right, like firstly, we get this thing about like it's, you're just gonna create a spiral of violence, like that uh, us torturing is, is what makes us have to torture. Uh, us torturing is what makes 7-7 bombers, it's what, what makes 9-11 bombers. We say, firstly, 
like massively distorted like position on the truth there. Like one of many reasons why these people do these things, certainly, but not the, the whole reason. Like we say like when you when you like economically cripple their country so that they're they're destined and their families are destined to live in poverty, like don't do that. Okay? Like that that'll make them angry. Like, we also say that, like, it, we're not always the ones responsible, no thank you. Like, it's not always the stories of how, like, Amik Khan, if he had been found, would have been tortured. It's not that, because it's something that is so far, so long ago, and so far outside of our control. Like, the crusade rhetoric that still persists in, in, in the Islamic societies to this day. We say, yes, torture and horrible methods were used then, and, like, necessarily so in many cases. We also say that we bear no responsibility for that, because our society has changed so much, and that it's just a fact of life that these people choose to believe that us choosing to torture now or not will not like diminish the efficacy of the rhetoric of like how disgusting the crusades were like whatsoever the, the crusades are discussing whether or not we torture now and the reason enough for these people to do what they do okay we also say like like how we like like it, it like the, the enemy um i don't know like also this idea of like welcome like they're giving us a welcome to this real world to, to the world that they live in no thank you like to, to the like th th that they perceive it as this real world and that ours is just a social construct uh, like we say it's a nice one um, it's not a very deep point it, like we like the world we live in and we're, we have every right to protect that world like we, when, when you say th no thank you like when, when, like when you say that like they, they live in this real world that is somehow more genuine and, and, and like more authentic than ours because it's violent or because it's primeval we say that, like, I don't buy that, and nor does anyone else in this room when you think of it in those terms. That's not the world that you want to live in, and, like, if your only defense of, of, like, stepping, of, like, living in that world is to step into it briefly, then that, that's what you have to do. We also say, like, on the point of efficacy, which we don't believe is the major point in this debate, well, like we say, every system has flaws, even if the British system is better, there's always going to be people slipping the net. It's outrageous to say that, like, no, 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 we'll never torture because we'll just be persuasive, no thank you, uh, and, then, and then, like, we'll be fine because we'll be really persuasive and we'll have a more persuasive, like, mode of, modus operandi. Like, like we say, Brit like, the, the British system may be better, but attacks on Britain still happen. So, like, that, like on that basis, your, like, whole idea of just using persuasion, persuasion clearly falls. When persuasion fails, and it should definitely be a first step, maybe you do have to resort to coercion. No, thank you. All right. Also, to lead on to this, what well, we were brought, I think, by Ra's, like this relativism, what if we're wrong, like, what if we're wrong in any wartime situation, we say that like, that, like, that, that, that applies absolutely <coughs> to any wartime situation. What if we're wrong and we're shooting people is the exact same argument as what if we're wrong and we're torturing people. No, thank you. So, so we say, like, the fact that we've set this debate in a wartime situation like already precludes that argument that we've already gone into the war the war has begun like we don't know in this situation whether it be just or not is for history to tell later no thank you like we say we are in a wartime situation and like that is not really the question you can't continually ask yourself that during the war for the sake of winning the war we also say like Ross gives us this truism of sure like torture is disgusting and i wouldn't do it on my worst enemy ladies and gentlemen i'd rather not have a worst enemy Okay, I'd rather not be in a wartime situation, and I agree torture is disgusting. However, I think what is far more morally apparent, and I'll take someone after this, is the things that we torture to stop people doing, and I'll take Owen. Will we say, like, if, there, if like, torturing one person, like, if, if, if there is, like, a massive benefit to, to torturing, like, one of these Iranian people for these gay people, then maybe yes. Okay, like, like, like maybe if like in, in one, like, but can you actually present me in any one case where you torture, torture one person and like a million gay people don't end up like being murdered in a, in a future situation? Like that's not really tangible. Whereas like when you say, when you know that someone has this information, like has information on a bomb and then you torture them, like, and you know, and you know that you're going to be saving lives, like then that's okay or more okay, more likely. No, thank you. Also, I want to play this like ludicrous probability game that were brought like, what if you don't know? Like, what if you don't know? Uh, and obviously you don't know. Like, you never can have absolute certainty in these situations. It's something we have to accept, no thank you. But we say like, 
if you look at the collateral damage, just like way up the things, like if you have like 100% certainty that the attack is going to happen if you don't do anything, multiplied by a million lives lost, versus like 50% certainty that you can stop the attack following torture and one life loss, we say like 0.5 is significantly less than 1 million, and therefore you should go for the lesser harm there. No, thank you. All right, like also, like I want to bring up this idea, like this horrible situation of this German family uh, um, whose son was abducted. Uh, it, it was rather disgusting uh, by this absolute sadist who was, who was just someone that like you don't apply human rights to in, in your head. You don't, you don't associate with him. You have nothing in common with this man morally. He is not like you or me. He doesn't believe in, in like rights to people. He doesn't believe things like children should not be raped or like should not be cut up into pieces as this, as this boy was and thrown in a bag and thrown in a river. The police chose to torture this, this man and the German courts like pardoned them of so doing. Why do they do that? Because any one of us in that situation when we have a fear in our hearts of like the fate of this little boy and we know that the only thing you can do to save that little boy may be to torture this man who is not on a par with that boy or with anyone in this room is to torture him and like and we say like this, this is an analogous case to many terrorists like we say that that ladies and gentlemen is when torture is okay when you talk about people like this man who's not an enemy of one state in particular but is an enemy of all people like us who have a strong sense of morality that is normal and not sadistic and purely disgusting we say that ladies and gentlemen is when torture is okay i urge you to propose I, I will wave them. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen of the Philosophical Society. Um, I guess I'm the sort of institutionalised, raving hippie kind of idea of an opposition which Mr. McDonnell had in mind by virtue of my degree. And I use, which is international peace studies, by the way, uh, and I use the idea of virtue importantly because I think at the point, and, and the proposition today have talked to us about being able to use people to benefit ourselves, and I think there is something to be said at the point where we are willing to use people as tools, that we are exactly the same as the kind of people who want to use the examples that the speaker before me used about people being used as tools, and there's a problem with that, and perhaps at a slightly kind of schizophrenic change from my personality, I actually want to talk about the practicalities that happen <laughs> when we discuss the use of torture. I want to look at the abstraction that that we've had from like proposition today and talk about the kind of people that that abstraction ends up applying to people like Palestinian people people like the people who live next door to these terrorists there's a reason why I asked what is the kind of information that you think is important and the reason and the information that we were told is important is where these people are and what they are doing and the people who know this information are not just soldiers that we can point out and say we know they are the enemy they are the kind of people who live next door they are children. They are vulnerable people. And is there, and like, my question basically is, is there a kind of torture that is too far? We have a split in the proposition. Some people say no. They want to fight war on maths and say that there is a calculation that we can make where people are worth numbers that we can decide upon. At that point, I say there are probably things that happen in war way beyond the sort of pragmatic calculus that you want to have. And it's wishful thinking that you can do that. Because it's not just about the war that we are fighting, but the way in in which we fight the war that is important and if it isn't important then why the hell do war crimes exist at all why is it not okay for soldiers just to go and kill all of an enemy no thank you because the best way to win a war and the best way to say that we will never face this as a problem again is to kill all of the fuckers whoops sorry <laughs> it is, is to kill all of them not to say we will fight this war in a particular way because we think it is morally best 
That is not the kind of way in which we think it is all right to fight a war, and that no one claims to be okay to fight a war, because genocide, I think, is a fairly obvious wrong. You would have thought torture is also a fairly obvious wrong, but apparently not. I like, also would love to know, no thank you, like, what kind of torture isn't long-lasting? I think that's an argument of abstraction. I don't think that's relevant, really, to this kind of debate. But the other idea of like videoing this and um, torture the idea of torture is essentially violating a sphere of personal personal and uh, physical and mental security to the point that you can no longer live securely within your own body that is not the kind of physical or mental idea that i think we should place upon any individual particularly when we do not know what that person knows and there are like ideas of risk that we really have to take into account i think we have to take take into account equally what happens when we do that the sort of tortures which people justify as being like that are the ones where they put a sack over your head and put you in the dark and leave you there for times that you don't even know where you have to sit do that awful gym thing that you had to do in PE back in the day where you like sit like that against the wall and your thighs really hurt that's the kind of thing that places like Israel use against Palestinians and say by virtue of the fact that they live in a given territory by virtue of the fact that they probably know someone who is a member of Hamas and by virtue of the fact that their mere existence, no thank you, is them constituting a threat to our, self, our state. That is the sort of stuff that is used legitimately as torture and is justified as torture and is being okay because these are people who do not live within a state. They don't have someone to advocate for their rights. They are people who are outside the Geneva Convention, as we were given as a legal justification by the proposition today. I think, hum and I'll take you in a second, Ricky. Um, I think there's a legal justification, like, uh, like a humanitarian justification beyond the realms of being a citizen of a state that means that you should be treated in a particular way. And when you can turn around and point to a state saying they penalize me and torture me because of who I am and not because of what I do and not because of something certain that they know that there is a problem and all of the narratives that my fellow speakers have talked about on opposition today apply yes just taking it from a realistic standpoint of flesh I never really have to worry for the most part of an Islamic person picking me up and torturing me what I do have to worry about is some fundamentalist coming up and causing a disaster in my state can you maybe me the people I care about why on a practical level should I, apart from some vague conception of philosophy that I don't mean anything to me, care about their welfare if their negative aspects can protect me and my family? Okay, for the exact same reason why you say that you should care about yourself, they should care about themselves too. You say you are scared about an atrocity, about a country or an individual coming and damaging your life and throwing everything upside down and making the world that you live in no longer livable in for you. That is exactly what you do when you have the pervasive narratives of my state can come and do the exact same thing to any member of an enemy that we choose to define because they by virtue of the fact that they are an enemy the exact same rules apply and if you turn around and tell me they shouldn't be able to do that to me then that is why we shouldn't be able to go around and do it to them as well and the reason why why we fought, fight wars are important no thank you that the methods we use are important is because wars are not just isolated events that are abstracted out of time and never have consequences what happens in a war impacts what happens after a war war as well, how we rebuild those post conflict communities and how they see us, no thank you, and the help that we wish to give them. That is really, really important. There are reasons why the kind of activities that constitute torture, when soldiers commit that in other countries, those, like, those societies are impossible to build, rebuild even, uh, is because people can no longer relate to that. They always have to point, this is the person that tortured me. And when soldiers do it, when like agents of the state do it, then that is always associated with the state as well. It's not just that that individual did it, it's that entire group did that to me. There's a reason why Rwanda had to write out the idea of ethnicity from its constitution entirely, and even outlaw the mem like the, the, being able to talk about it, unless you're talking about that conflict, the, the genocide in 1992. And the reason for that is, if they turn up, it's because they can't even look at each other that way anymore and function as a state. They can't function as a cohesive community when all the time they can do and all they can think of is that's what they did to me. They think I am this threat. They think I am someone that I am not. These are the pervasive narratives that are done to coerce people to become our enemy in the first place. And there are like ideas of culpability, questions about whether soldiers who are conscripted into the army and are made to do things they wouldn't otherwise do, are they legitimate enemies? Are they legitimate targets for us? Are people just because they live in an area a legitimate target for us? Are people who happen to know something because they live next door 
worth degrading their humanity to the point that they cannot even live within their own bodies. I wonder if there's a torture that is too much to happen, whether we would allow sexual torture or the torture of children because the knowledge that they might have would save me. I think there is more to our humanity than that and the more to the world than that. So for all these reasons, I beg to oppose. Mr. Speaker, the safety of the people is the highest law because fundamentalist groups can never be appeased and cannot be fought with conventional warfare because these groups don't engage within the rules of war. They don't sign up to international conventions because when we see civilians dying in war as collateral at worst or unfortunate or harsh atrocities at best, they see them as targets. They see them as legitimate and a job well done because they operate in the shadows of society with small teams of operatives to, comp to conspire in secret and to strike without warning, to attack what we hold dear. So I want to talk about two things. Firstly, I want to talk about how torture actually is effective. And I'm going to talk about one example specifically where it's been incredibly effective. And then I want to talk about morality, but not in the sense of a state institutionalizing it, but in the sense of one individual person deciding to torture because he feels it's right for that effort in the war, that individual interrogator. OK, but first, a couple of responses I've heard. So in terms of long-term harms, and we, should do it, we shouldn't do these lasting long-term harms and something about caveats. Like, I feel, I think it's entirely legitimate to do so as long as we have a high threshold for who we're actually torturing or who we know we're picking up. Someone like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who actually had a vast amount of evidence against him and who openly gloated about the fact that he had planned 9-11, about the fact that he had beheaded Daniel Perel. Okay? Um, no, thank you. In terms of blowback, like, and about the crimes we, we commit and the atrocities we commit in the Middle East. I think individuals in these groups will always decide to pick an enemy of the West or decide to pick an enemy of another because they're insane generally, because they're irrational. So they'll pick that target. They'll always want to fight that war. So it's still going to happen regardless of whatever blowback happens. But secondly, like I don't think torture should be an institutionalized policy or a policy that any government advocates, but just rather the individual making that decision, that invi individual interrogator. Maybe we can punish them afterwards for it, but I still think that act is entirely morally legitimate if it gets them the goals they want. That's what I want to talk about. Okay, so does torture work? Like, first of all, how does it work? Because there hasn't been much talk about that. Well, generally, it's not about beating the crap out of them until you get confessions. You don't pound away until they give them information. Like, there sh and there should be a high threshold again for the individuals you do it to. But what it works is by moving them from a psychological state of so to move them from the psychological state away from resistance and to cooperation. So there's a number of ways you can do this. You can create an incentive for them not to lie by, like I gave in a point of information, giving them questions about information you already know, and when they lie, they're incentivized not to lie again because that torture continues. It creates a psychological state in your brain where you won't lie again, generally. Or secondly, just by creating incentive um, no, thank you. We are just creating an incentive not to be tortured again at all, because they'll essentially know that when they do find out the information is false, they'll just torture them again. So once you create that incentive in someone's brain, they're less they're less likely to do so to give up the information. Yeah. Like in uh, Fletch. Okay, this is the Democratic Republic of the Congo an okay place to live? Probably not because of the perpetual threat of violence. Well, like. I'm just saying religion, but as our Western force in doing it and picking the individuals we feel uh, should be tortured. Like, in, in this kind of war that we're talking about with non-state actors who are inherently, like, whose sole aim is to destroy us, not to fight in a war, but just to crush any ideals we believe in. In that sense, like, it is more acceptable, especially when you have that amount of evidence where you can say someone is guilty or someone has plotted the deaths of thousands of people. And even then, like, even... I, I even think like if an individual knows about the deaths of thousands of people but isn't directly culpable, they still have that blood on their hands, so it's legitimate to do so as well. Okay, um, so like, we see just a recent example of when Liam Pereira, the former head of the CIA, was asked in a, a direct question, was enhanced interrogation used to, to lead to the capture of Osama bin Laden? The direct quote was, obviously there was some valuable information recovered from these techniques. And when Obama released the, the memos that the, for, from Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's torture, 
um, they left out massive parts. All the parts where information was actually gathered. And Liam Panetta has since said that 30%, up to 30% of what the CIA know about Al Qaeda and their operations was gathered from him willing to eventually talk. So like, it was effective in that scenario and it can be effective. I'm not saying it always is. Unfortunately, sometimes there is collateral in war. Like, hopefully it generally is effective. No, thank you. Anyway, I'm willing to take the chance. So, in terms of morality, uh, because it's never legitimate to legalize or institutionalize it, but it is legitimate on, indivi <coughs> on an individual level. Like Brandon talked about, about the father, who, or about, about the police torturing the, the, the guy who kidnapped the child. <coughs> because like, in that scenario, it actually did lead to information. Unfortunately, the child was dead, but it worked in that scenario. And we feel that is legitimate on an individual moral level, because nobody would tell themselves that in a state of necessity where they had to absolutely do something, and maybe this situation doesn't even exist, maybe it's a hypothetical situation, but you still have to ask yourself, if you had no other choice, if you felt you had to torture, would you do it? Because that's what the level of morality comes down to when you argue against them. It's not, should I have widespread torture against the enemy? Should I use the... the torture just to suppress them. It's, it's to go to this singular level of morality where you ask, would I do that in some situation? No, thank you. So in that sense, I feel torture is justified. Because killing in war is justified and when you strive for peace. This is the same thing. It's killing, striving for saving others, saving in defense of others. Entirely legitimate. I'll take a PI. Yeah. <coughs> Look, if you just have this sort of arbitrary system of leave it to somebody on the day to figure out what's appropriate for us, What's to stop them from thinking the appropriate force is kidnapping their wife and punching their skull and raping their kids and then shooting them in the kneecap and telling the truth? Where is the end of the line for horrible well. forms? <laughs> <laughs> I would. I would assume it's an individual who is an interrogator, and if it's not, then there are generally societal safeguards in place to stop you doing that, like people not looking particularly favourably on raping someone and smashing their skull in. Like, we feel <laughs> that's just a bad thing to do. It's, it's not like you will carry that out. We feel moral constraints stop you from doing that. And as I've said, we could punish those people. I don't, I think possibly we can. I'm still saying the act is legitimately moral. Like, we punish people who sometimes do moral things because we feel it falls without, outside our laws. Um, so finally, just a thing about how terrorists aren't people. So like, people, <laughs> so, people so, so, so essentially like, the people who do meet this arbitrary threshold that I've said, like don't buy into anything we believe in, who don't, who rather see the destruction, but because some men just want to see the world burn. Because we're all said the enemy is legitimate, if, if we are, they legitimize it. But they already do torture us. They already do kill our civilians, our journalists, like Daniel Pearl. They do so anyway. We're not legitimizing them because they already feel legitimate in, do, le legitimate in doing so. Like, for all that, we beg you to do Ladies and gentlemen, when I signed up to speak at this week's debate, I thought of making a two-minute speech. It was then that I realized that Defense of the Indefensible is next week. But seriously, within this debate... <laughs> but seriously, within this debate, Time and time again, the proposition have tried to present us with false dichotomies. By, by changing the circumstances, governing the situations that we're uh, confronted with, within war, and by basically shifting the goalposts, they have tried to extract concessions from people, from us, that in some cases, torture can be justified. Now, there are some things which, as human actions, disgust us so fundamentally that we say that they're never justified. And what I say is that torture is one of those circumstances. So the contentions within this debate are whether torture actually works and whether it's moral. So those will be the two things that I'll be looking at. So what we get is a continuous time bomb tautology, whereby if we don't torture people, then innocent lives are going to die. Or in the case, as Logan said, in war, that our civilization's existence is therefore threatened. I think this is a highly dangerous 
dangerous mentality. It's epistemologically dubious at best, and it's arrogantly axiomatic at worst. Why is this? Because I'll take a look at the first element of this. It's based upon a false dichotomy. It's, it's constructed sheerly on the premise that if we do not torture, that we are going to come to an end ourselves, that bad things are going to happen, even if it can be shown that a bomb does exist or that our enemy will come to destroy us. We can only know that retrospectively after it has happened, thus meaning that torture by that logic can only be justified retrospectively, thus invalidating the premise that we could know that we had to torture out of necessity in the first place. No thank you. The second problem with this is, uh, is the fact that not everybody actually has the information that we have. If we have a certain number of, of people who are prisoners, we have no guarantee that any of them have information at all, never mind that any significant I mean proportion. Because it happens many times in life, these people actually don't have the information. And no amount of torture can exist, non-existent data or, or extracted. And like what happens then as a consequence is that we torture people who are either innocent or they, or they were never the objective of our tortures in the first place. When that happens, we become morally culpable for, for somebody who is tortured under a false premise, and that reduces our own humanity. But there's a more, there's a more significant danger, no thanks, Andrew, and that's the fact that inaccurate information comes out in torture. Because one thing is certain, and that's that when people are under duress and they're under pain, they will confess to anything, be it stealing the crown jewels of England or, 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 or murdering one's own parents. If you're under pain, your, your psychological state is transformed, transformed so absolutely that you will do anything to end it. And what follows from this is that people give inaccurate information. It leads authorities on a wild goose chase, which is more anti-productive than having done nothing in the first place. And what follows again from this is that any information that actually is extracted, which may actually be accurate, becomes untrustworthy because of the high risk this information is inaccurate within the first place. Take even the, the circumstance of ticking time bond. Let's say we we were able to uh, capture an Islamic fascist who was, who was planning 9-11. The odds that they would actually confess uh, the uh, information that would be able to stop 9-11 uh, stop from happening are, are extremely low to the extent of not even being, being useful in the first place because these are people who would rather die than seed information to us within the first place. That is the reality of ticking time bomb circumstances. The people we capture want to see bad things happen and they will not confess even if they are under duress. So I'll take Andrew. Yes, and we use psychological torture to convince them the events already happened, and then they tell us afterwards how they planned it well, and then we use psychological torture to actually stop the event. Okay, no, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous, Andrew. I mean, once again, it's completely symptomatic of the, of, of the attitude that we can simply define these arbitrary circumstances, say the, the X, Y, and Z will definitely happen, therefore torture follows from that. So the efficacy of torture doesn't have a leg to stand on. Every single study has shown it to be, it'd be ineffective, and nobody on the proposition has named a single example where torture has actually worked. So there's something, there's a more... <laughs> no, Logan, it didn't work. It, but, but there's a more de deeply disturbing moral consequence of this because the, the misguided idea that we, we have to torture and that it will work gives us a license to be moral monsters and to leave our moral responsibility at the door. And essentially what it means is that any things become justified because it's in our interest. Because the reason why we as humans generally don't do disgusting things to other people is because we are humans ourselves and we understand the desire that even if we may have done a bad thing, not to have something even worse done to us. If nothing else, two wrongs certainly don't make a right. It's a, it's a, it was within an appeal to reasonability. But when, when you, you torture people, you forfeit any right you have to be outraged when your enemy does, does these bad things to you as well. Because, when you, if we, because the logic of constant proposition also extends to, to using any means necessary to procure that information. That extends to torturing their family, their children, in front of them, even though they, that, uh, they're innocent. That's the sheer extent of how, of how the moral compass becomes distorted beyond any reasonable recognition. And it brings about a certain type of moral arrogance and hypocrisy, because during World War II, when the Allies fought against the Nazis and the Japanese, when, when soldiers fighting for, for, the, for the other side killed people on our side, they were simply defending their country. They were simply acting in their own self-defense. When Japanese torturers use waterboarding on American soldiers, we call them moral monsters. What we, we do to their soldiers is no difference. To, different to the Japanese, when we do to their soldiers, we are the moral monsters, ladies and gentlemen. This is, and this is where we dehumanize ourselves, because there's a significant danger with allowing your moral compass to be cited on the sheer surmise of what is in your best interest. It allows you to do and say moral
morally disgusting things and do and normalise to, to a select minority of people things which we can never conceivably think justifiable to any other person. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm talking about is dispelling the myth that we ever need to torture. It's an ineffective method based on dubiously axiomatic circumstances that even if proven true would, would, would be no less immoral and vile as a consequence. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what I stand for. Thank you. Thank you very much for the speech, indeed all the speakers, for the debate this evening. We'll just go straight to the vote. Those who have to the enemy, please say aye. 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 Those who would not say a, then nay. Nay. The motion clearly defeated. A few notes before.